All right, we're reading Homesick by Jean Fritz. In my father's study, there was a large globe with all of the countries of the world running around it. I could put my finger on the exact spot where I was where I was and had been ever since I was born, and I was on the wrong side of the globe. I was in China in a city named Hancock, a dot on a crooked line that seemed to break the country right in two. The line was really the Yangtze River, but who would really know by looking at a map what the Yangtze River really was? Orange-brown, muddy, mustard-colored, and wide, 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 with a river smell that was old and came all the way up from the bottom. Sometimes old women knelt on the riverbank, begging the river god to return a son or grandson who may have drowned. They would wail and beat the earth to make the river god pay attention, but I knew how busy the river god must be. All those people on the Yangtze River? Coolies hauling water, women washing clothes, houseboats swarming with old people and young, chickens and goats, big crooked sailed junks with eyes painted on their prowls so they could see where they were going. I loved the Yangtze River, but of course, I belonged on the other side of the world, in America, with my grandmother. Twenty-five fluffy yellow chicks hatched from our eggs today, my grandmother wrote. I wrote my grandmother that I had watched a Chinese magician swallow three yards of fire. The trouble with living on the wrong side of the world was that I didn't feel like a real American. For instance, I could never be president of the United States. I didn't want to be president. I wanted to be a writer. Still, why should there be a law saying that only a person born in the United States could be president? If It was as if I wouldn't be American enough. Actually, I was American every minute of the day, especially during school hours. I went to a British school, and every morning we say, sang God Save the King. Of course, the British children loved singing about their gracious king. Ian Forbes stuck out his chest and sang as if he was saving the king all by himself. Everyone sang. Even Gina Boss, who was Italian, and Vera Sebastian, who was so Russian she dressed the way Russian girls did a long time ago before the revolution when her family had to run away and keep from being killed. But I wasn't Vera Sebastian. I asked my mother to write me an excuse so that I wouldn't have to sing, but she wouldn't do it. When in Rome, she said, do as the Romans do. What she meant was, don't make trouble, just sing. So for a long time I did. I sang with my fingers crossed, but still I felt like a traitor. Then one day I thought, if my mother and father were really truly in Rome, they wouldn't do what the Romans did at all. They'd probably try to get the Romans to do what they did, just like they were trying to teach the Chinese to do what the Americans did. My mother even gave classes in American manners. So that day I quit singing. I kept my mouth locked tight against the King of England. Our teacher, Miss Williams, didn't notice at first. She stood in front of the room, using her ruler as a baton and striking each syllable so hard it was as if, it was as if she was making up for the time she had nothing to strike. Miss Williams was pinch-faced and bossy. Sometimes I wondered what ever made her come to China. Maybe to try and catch a husband, my mother said. A husband, Miss Williams? Make him victorious, the class sang. It was on the strike of Vic that Miss Williams noticed. Her eyes lighted on my mouth, and when we sat down, she pointed her ruler at me. Is there something wrong with your voice today, Jean? She asked. No, Miss Williams. You weren't singing. No, Miss Williams. It's not my national anthem. It's the national anthem we sing here, she snapped. You have always sung. Even Vera sings it. I looked at Vera with a big blue bow tied on top of her head. Usually I felt sorry for her, but not today. At recess, I might even untie that bow, I thought. Just give it a yank. But if I'd been smart, I wouldn't have been looking at Vera. I would have been looking at Ian Forbes, and I would have known that, no matter what Miss Williams said, I wasn't through with the King of England. Recess at the British school was nothing I looked forward to. Every day we played a game called Prisoner's Space, which was running and shouting and shoving and catching. I hated the game, yet everyone played except Vera Sebastian. She sat on the sidelines under her blue bow like someone who had been dropped out of a history book. By recess, I had forgotten my plans for that bow. While everyone was getting ready for the game, I was, as usual, trying to look as if I didn't care if I was the last one picked for the team or not. I was leaning against the high stone wall that ran around the schoolyard. I was looking up at the white clouds skittering across the sky when, all at once, someone trampled down on hard on my right foot. Ian Forbes, snarling bulldog face, heel grinding down on my toes, 
head thrust forward the way an animal might before it strikes. You wouldn't sing it, so say it, he ordered. Let me hear you say it. I tried to pull my foot away, but he only ground down harder. Say what? I was telling my face, please not to show what my foot felt. God save the king. Say it. Those four words. I want to hear you say it. Although Ian Forbes was short, he was solid and tough and built for fighting. What was more, he always won. You only had to look at his bare knees between the tops of his socks and his short pants to know that he would win. His knees were square, bony and unbeatable. So of course it was crazy for me to argue with him. Why should I, I asked. Americans haven't said that since George the Third. He grabbed my arm and twisted it behind my back. Say it, he hissed. I felt the tears come to my eyes and I hated myself for the tears. I hated myself for not staying in Rome the way my mother had told me. I'll never say it, I whispered. They were choosing sides now in the schoolyard and Ian's name was being called, among the first as always. He gave my arm another twist. You'll sing tomorrow, he snarled, or you'll be bloody sorry. As he ran off, I slid to the ground, my head between my knees. Oh, Grandma, I thought, why can't I be there with you? I'd feed the chickens for you. I'd pump water from the well, the way my father used to do. It was. It would be almost two years before we'd go to America. I was ten years old now. I'd be twelve then. But how could I think about years? I didn't even dare think about the next day. After school, I ran all the way home, fast, so I couldn't think at all. Our house stood behind a high stone wall, which had broke chips of broken glass sticking up from the top to keep thieves away. I flung open the iron gate and threw myself through the front door. I'm home, I yelled. Then I remembered it was Tuesday, the day my mother taught an English class at the YMCA, where my father was the director. I stood in the hall, trying to catch my breath, and as always, I began to feel small. It was a huge hall with ceiling so high, it was as if there was nothing... It, was if they would have nothing to do with people. Certainly not with a mere child, not with me, the only child in the house. Once I asked my best friend Andrea if the hall made her feel little too. She said no. She was going to be a dancer, and she loved space. She did a high kick to show how grand it was to have room. Andrea Hull was a year older than I was and knew about everything sooner. She told me about commas, for instance, long before I took punctuation seriously. How could I write letters without commas, she asked. She made me feel so ashamed that for months I hung little wagging comma tails all over the letters to my grandmother. She told me things that sounded so crazy I had to ask my mother if they were true, like where babies come from, and that some day the world, the whole world would end. My mother would frown when I asked her, but she always agreed that Andrea was right. It made me furious. How could she know such things and not tell me? What was the matter with grown-ups anyway? I wished Andrea were with me now, but she lived in the country, and I didn't see her very often. Lynn Nainai, my ama, was the only one around, and of course I knew she'd be there. It was her job to stay with me when my parents were out. As soon as she heard me come in, she'd call, Sai Lu Shang, which meant that she was upstairs. She might be mending or ironing, but most likely she'd be sitting by the window embroidering. And she was. She even had my embroidery laid out, for we had made a bargain. She would teach me to embroider if I would teach her English. I liked embroidering. The cloth stretched tight within my embroidery hoop while I filled in the stamped pattern with cross stitches and lazy daisy flowers. The trouble was not the lazy daisies. The trouble was that the lazy daisies needed French knots that were for their centers, and I hated making French knots. Mine always fell apart, so I left them to the end. Today, I had twenty lazy daisies waiting for their knots. Lynn Nainai had already threaded my needle with embroidery floss. Black centers, she said, for the yellow flowers. I felt myself glowering. American flowers don't have centers, I said, and I gave her back the needle. Lynn Nainai looked at me, puzzled, but she did not argue. She was different from the other amas. She did not even come from the servant class, although this was a secret we had to keep from the other servants who were, who would have made her life miserable had they known. She had run away from her husband when he had taken a second wife. She would always have been wife number one and the boss no matter how many wives he had, but she would rather be no wife than head of a string of wives. She was modern. She looked old-fashioned, for her feet had been bound up tight when she was a little girl so they would stay small, and now, like many Chinese women, she walked around on little stumps stuffed into tiny cloth shoes. 
Lynn and I, and I were embroidered with butterflies. Still, she believed in true love and one wife for one husband. We were good friends, Lynn and I, and I, so I didn't know why I felt so mean. She shrugged. English lesson, she said, smiling. I tested my arm to see if it still hurt from the twist. It did. My foot, too. What do you want to know? I asked. We had been through polite phrases. Please and thank you. I beg your pardon. Excuse me. You're welcome. Merry Christmas. Which she had practiced but hadn't had a chance to use this since it was only October. If I meet an American on the street, she asked, how do I greet him? I looked her straight in the eye and nodded my head in greeting. Sewing machine, I said. You say, sewing machine. She repeated after me, making the four syllables into four separate words. She got up and walked around the room, bowing and smiling. So ing machine. Part of me wanted to laugh at the thought of Lynn Nainai maybe meeting Dr. Carhart, our minister, whose face would surely puff up, the way it always did when he was flustered. But part of me didn't want to laugh at all. I didn't like it when my feelings got tangled. So I ran downstairs and played chopsticks on the piano, loud and fast. When my sore arm hurt, I just beat the keys harder. Then I went to the kitchen to see if Yang Su Zi Fu, the cook, would give me something to eat. I found him reading a Chinese newspaper, his eyes going up and down with the characters. Chinese words don't march across flat surfaces the way ours do. They drop down cliffs, one cliff after another, from right to left across a page. Can I have a piece of cinnamon toast, I asked, and a cup of cocoa? Yang Zi Fu grunted. He was smoking a cigarette, which he wasn't supposed to do in the kitchen, but Yang Zifu did mostly what he wanted. He considered himself superior to common workers. You could tell because of his fingernails on his pinkies. They were at least two inches long, which was his way of showing that he didn't have to use his hands for rough or dirty work. He didn't seem to care that his fingernails were dirty, or maybe he couldn't keep them such long nails clean. He made my toast while the cigarette dangled out of the corner of his mouth, collecting a long ash that finally fell on the floor. He wouldn't have kept smoking if my mother had been there, although he didn't always pay attention to my mother. Never about the butter pagodas, for instance. No matter how many times my mother told him before a dinner party, no butter pagoda, it made no difference. As soon as everyone was seated, the serving boy, Wang Zifu, would bring in a pagoda and set it on the table. The guests would ooh and ah, for it was a masterpiece. A pagoda molded out of butter, curved roofs, rising tier upon tier. But my mother could only think of how unsanitary it was. For, of course, Yang Zifu had molded the butter with his hands and carved the decorations with one of his long fingernails. Still, we always used the butter, for if my mother sent it back to the kitchen, Yang Zifu would lose face and quit. When my toast and cocoa were ready, I took them upstairs to my room, the blue room, and while I ate, I began Sarah Crew again. Now there was a girl, I thought, who was worth crying over. I wasn't going to think about myself, or Ian Forbes, or the next day. I wasn't. I wasn't. And I didn't. Not all afternoon, not all evening. Still, I must have decided what I was going to do because the next morning when I started for school and came to the corner where the man sold hot hot chestnuts, the corner where I always turned to go to school, I didn't turn. I walked straight ahead. I wasn't going to school that day. End of part one.